everyone can hear me. I see people are joining here. I'm going to give it a, a few more seconds. We had a, we have a, a lot of folks registered for this. We're really thrilled at the level of interest uh, that we have uh, in this the subject matter of Japanese knotweed in the Upper Delaware River watershed. Um, so this. Okay, we got we got a good amount of participants here. So I'm Jeff Skelding. I am executive director of the Friends of the Upper Delaware River. We are a uh, nonprofit organization, uh, watershed nonprofit watershed protection organization. We're located in Hancock, New York, at the confluence of the East and West Branch of the Upper Delaware River, and we have full time staff, four full time staff people, in an office right in the downtown village of. Hancock, New York. I know there's many folks on the phone that we know and know us, and there are plenty of others uh, that we hope to get to know better. Thanks to Lisa DeRigo and New York League of Conservation Voters uh, and uh, our other sponsors for this program tonight. I'm just gonna say a few a brief opening words here to set the stage, and then we're gonna turn it over to our panelists who are the our project partners and are doing the, the technical and detail work on this project. And they're gonna lay it all out for you over the, over the course of the next hour. So how we got here uh, oh, four or five years ago, for my organization and many other conservation organizations up and down the Delaware River watershed, uh, under the leadership of a coalition for the Delaware River watershed based in Trenton, New Jersey, who most, many of you know, I know, spent a lot of time in Washington and in the home district offices of congressional representatives talking about the importance of uh, putting together uh, a federally authorized Delaware River program, like so many other iconic aquatic ecosystems around the country have had for years. Uh, that, we, that, was, that had not been accomplished yet for the Delaware River, but we got it done in 2017. And with that, uh, under the administration of the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, there's a grant program associated with that, with, uh, with the, what's called the Delaware River Basin Restoration Program. Uh, grants are administered through the Delaware Watershed Conservation Fund. And we are now, that program is entering its fourth year, um, highly successful, helping organizations like mine uh, and other types of academic institutions and uh, municipalities uh, secure grant funding to protect and restore the, restore the Delaware, the Delaware, the Delaware. Tonight is a good example of that. This is made possible. This project is made possible through a grant from the federal Delaware River program. So we're really proud to have been part of that and thankful to receive the, the funding and resources that uh, we desperately need to tackle this problem that um, is, um, I would put probably for the Upper Delaware River, probably in, you know, the t definitely in a tier one category of ecological threats uh, in our in our region and in our watershed. Um, so we, you know, we live up here. We're on the river all the time. We're fishing and recreating in the river. And uh, many of us on this phone call have watched this problem just get worse and worse and worse. And um, you know, we finally. Uh, we finally uh, talked about it enough and then we decided we we're going to do something about it and that's why we're here tonight and um, with that I'm gonna, you know I'm going to turn it over to our project partners uh, our first speaker is going to be Steve Schwartz he's my neighbor in northeast Pennsylvania on the river I try to call him the knotweed king but he doesn't want me to do that but every opportunity I get I do that especially in front of 150 people sorry Steve Steve's really been uh, instrumental in pulling together the thinking about how we're going to attack this problem from uh in a very systematic way and that's 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 um again what we're going to talk about in detail tonight we also have dr claire jansen and uh, eric dr eric burkhart with us pivotal or uh, really important uh project partners that are going to get us down the road here and understanding this understanding what we're dealing with and thinking about ways to implement um ways to to curb it and control the proliferation of, of Japanese knotweed in the Upper Delaware River watershed. With that, Steve, I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Lisa. So, so um, let me. The, uh, the way that knotweed has developed in the Upper Delaware is 
uh, amazing and it's caught all of our attention. And there are many people who know it, who see it, who have it on their property. And there are a lot of people that are dealing with it in one way or another. And there are a lot of people that would like to learn to deal with it. And, uh, and then there are people that we'd like to share some information so that they can choose to deal with it. Um, next slide, please. So this project was designed to combine both research and action and to try to address the problem at a landscape scale since it's a landscape scale problem. The uh, knotweed is a really bad invasive plant. We've seen it take over large stretches of the river over the last 20 years. And there are places where you can go for a mile and there's nothing but solid knotweed along the banks. It spreads rapidly. It, always looks for opportunities. And the bad part of it is that it crowds out other native vegetation and it inhibits the growth of, and succession of other plants and, and uh, grasses and riparian vegetation. And we believe that leads to bank destabilization, erosion and soil loss. And, uh, and as a monoculture where it establishes and crowds out everything else, it's bad for the habitat for all the critters that rely on the riparian vegetation. So we know it's bad, but part of this project has been designed to try to quantify how bad is it. And we're gonna to start today's tonight's presentation with some of the research that's going on um, behind Knotweed in the Upper Delaware. And then we're going to go into what kind of actions are we planning to demonstrate that people can take and set some objectives to manage or control Knotweed on their property. Next slide. So it needs to be attacked at a landscape set scale. It's everywhere. Everywhere you look, you'll find Knotweed especially when it, in, the, in the late summer, when it goes into flower, um, you see these large stands of knotweed with beautiful white flowers. Um, but here's a picture that we took in one of our first aerial flights of calicoon. And you can see on the, on the image, this was done in the fall when the knotweed had um, dropped its leaves and was setting seed and had turned red. And all of those areas, the islands in the middle, the bank on the Calcoon side of the Delaware, um, all that rusty red is knotweed. And um, the only places where there is no knotweed are either where the river flow inhibits its growth, like in the upper island, or at the bridge there, you can see that a few landowners have cut past through the knotweed so that they can get from their houses down to the river. So um, it's everywhere. And because it's everywhere, we need to do, we need to attack it at a landscape scale by involving everybody in doing something. Um, so we've started out with research and, uh, and we're gonna talk about some of the research today um, from Eric and then Claire. And uh, what we're trying to do is trying to quantify the problem. So um, Eric's gonna start by talking about how to ID knotweed and there, he'll talk about how they're in fact three different species and depending on the distribution of those species, it may affect how it can be attacked. So I'll turn it over to Eric now. Great, thanks, Steve. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Eric Burkhardt. I'm with Penn State University uh, Shavers Creek Environmental Center and the Department of Ecosystem Science and Management. Um, and I teach a class here actually this semester on invasive plants. Uh, so I'm going to share a little bit of uh, academic information in terms of what do we mean by knotweed this evening uh, with you and um, talk a little bit about what we're trying to do to get a sense of what it is, which species or as we'll talk about a hybrid between the species that's actually invading and, and creating the problem. From a research step or from an action standpoint, um, to some degree, a knotweed is a knotweed. Uh, 
And what I mean by that is that they look very similar and they reproduce very similar uh, and they're equally aggressive or at least it would seem. Uh, but it does help to understand exactly which species might be involved and to actually drill down into what I just said a little bit further and see, well, is it equally all of the knotweeds that are present or the hybrid or um, a mixture of some? So um, we'll talk a little bit about what's meant by knotweed. Steve? So I, I suspect that most people that were on this or are on this uh, have a sense of knotweed already, or at least a visual cue of what knotweed looks like. Um, and it typically is a species that is quite large in stature. It's not something that is uh, easily missed. Uh, and yet you see a lot of different terminology for the plant. In this particular photo, we have what's known as Japanese knotweed, and you might see uh, the scientific name listed here as Rhinutria japonica. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, some of the taxonomic uh, features as well as some of the changes in names that you should be aware of when you're trying to look for resources on the internet, for example, um, or just follow along with what the latest is uh, regarding knotweed and knotweed management. Steve, please. Uh, and giant knotweed, which is a, a second species that we're going to talk about, really doesn't look much different. Uh, maybe it's a little bit bigger, hence the name giant, but that's a relative term. So what I want to talk about uh, in a little bit of time that I have available is kind of drill down on the species that are involved and what's going on and some of the traits that can be used to differentiate them in addition to just overall traits for knotweed identification. Next slide, please. So first of all, recognize this is a plant that's in the buckwheat family. That uh, old illustration that's on the right side there is actually a buckwheat plant. Um, and as a result, when the plant is in flower, it's quite obvious, as well as in fruit, as uh, Steve just shared with some of the aerial images. Uh, and there's three different genera that are typically listed as being uh, not weeds, if you will. And what I mean by genera is in botany, when we talk about uh, plants, we talk about a genus, and then we talk about a species, right? And so here we're gonna be talking about three different genera and three different species. Um, in a lot of the older literature, what you see is a reference to the genus polygonum. And Japanese knotweed may be referred to as, for example, polygonum cuspidatum. Okay. And uh, yet in other literature, you might see it listed as Rhinutria or Fallopia. Okay. The most current uh, genus, according to some authors, would be Fallopia, and according to others would be Rhinutria. And I'll talk just a little bit about that because you're probably already glazed over with all this botanical kind of uh, speak here. But the bottom line is um, the genus has changed and some of the species circumscriptions have changed largely because there's a lot of hybridization and a lot of genetic crossing that's going on. And it has complicated and obscured the situation for a long time. On top of that, what we're now finding out with the aid of genetic tools is that uh, a lot of the introductions that were made uh, were not necessarily the same genotype. These were different cultivated specimens that were introduced for different purposes. And so you have a lot of different uh, cultivars as they might be referred to or genetic lineages that were selected for different purposes. And they further have a little bit of variation that they've introduced. And so one of the things that we wanna recognize is that while it's easy to recognize knotweeds, sometimes following along with the botanical Latin or references to which knotweed we might be talking about and actually identifying in the field which knotweed we might be talking about can be quite difficult because uh, it's still evolving. This species is still evolving and it's hybridizing readily. And, um, and some of the characteristics that would be useful to separate some of these lineages uh, are quite uh, microscopic and difficult to look for. Next slide, please. Uh, in the plants of Pennsylvania, for example, uh, and I won't belabor this too much, but you'll notice that uh, the genus is listed as fallopia. And so if you look at our own database in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, PA flora or PA wildflower, uh, 
um, or any of the databases that might pull up um, the listing of this species. In many cases, you're going to see the genus listed as fallopia. Here, we're still talking about the same knotweed. Next slide, please. In uh, more recent years, our latest flora, which is adapted from the flora of the southeastern United States, which is a long strail sparrow of, uh, the genus has once again been moved back to Renutria, which is an older name for it. Uh, and so again, the point being that uh, the names are changing um, and you shouldn't be confused, but just make sure that you do your homework when you're reading information about knotweed. It should be Renutria, Polygonum, or Fallopia, the information that you're looking for, all right? Now within that, if we look at uh, whatever the genus might be, what's going on here, we actually have two species and a hybrid that has formed. All right, next slide, please. And so typically when we look at these species, one of the only things that we can really distinguish uh, readily during the entire growing season is the foliage. And traditionally, when we would look at the two straight species that have been introduced, and one of them is Japanese knotweed, Fallopia japonica or Raynutria japonica, the base of the leaf is what we would term truncate. It's squared off, it's not rounded. Uh, as, as a juxtaposition to that, we have the giant knotweed. And you can see that illustration right below truncate says chordate. That's a fancy term for heart-shaped. And so we think about giant knotweed, we're looking typically for a chordate leaf. Next slide, please. And so this illustrates it pretty well here. Um, if you're thinking along textbook lines, and of course nature is never quite as clean as a textbook. On the left side, we typically have a leaf that is larger, but again, that's a relative statement. But we look at the leaf blade at the base of it, and we see that it's heart-shaped or it's chordate. On the other side, we have a leaf that is truncate or squared off at the base. And as I just uh, suggested, these two species hybridize in many areas and they form something that's intermediate and that's pictured in the center and it may have some variable amount of heart-shaped lobing at the base. And that makes the hybrid in particular quite difficult to identify because it's intermediate and shares those characteristics. Next slide, please. And so uh, this past year, what we did is uh, visited a number of areas around Hancock in the upper Delaware. And we started to look at what was present up there in kind of a gross way. And what I mean is we didn't stop and look at some of the microscopic characteristics each and every uh, population, but generally just started to get a sense of what was growing in the area. And one of the thing you'll, things you'll notice from one of our uh, colleagues that was joining us and actually floated the Upper Delaware with us is that the leaves are quite variable. And that suggests that uh, this may be the hybrid that's the predominant um, species, if you will, that's in the upper Delaware. However, we were aware of the fact that uh, there's some research that was done a while ago and kind of buried in the literature that suggests that the most reliable feature actually to differentiate the species in the hybrid is this microscopic feature of these hairs or trichomes that are found on the underside of the leaf along the midrib. Next slide, please. And so there's a paper from all the way back in 2003 in Rodura um, that basically says this thing has been overlooked, this hybrid. Uh, again, you'll notice they're using the genus polygonum here. Don't let that confuse you. Uh, and that the hybrid actually has, yes, some traits of the flowers and leaf shape that can be useful. But again, that it's really these microscopic features if you really need to figure out which thing this is that you want to look for. And so the final slides. Slide, please. So again, Jessica, taking this information uh, after our float, went back to several areas and started to look around. Um, and it's worth noting that this particular characteristic is associated uh, best with plants during the early part of the growing season. That is, these hairs or trichomes fall off as the season goes on. So our plan this year is actually to revisit these stretches of the upper Delaware and look more carefully with a hand lens, for example, at many of the what look like clones that are occupying places like islands and such and try and figure out what we're dealing with. 
And it would absolutely make sense, as Jessica is suggesting from her investigations, that it may be that the predominant species up there is the hybrid. It would make sense that this thing is, as a hybrid, perhaps experiencing hybrid vigor and is much more aggressive and rapid spreading as a result. And so if you look at her pictures here, which we're going to take a few better pictures this year, but it still illustrates what we're looking for. Uh, from left to right, you're comparing essentially what the pubescence is on the underside. And if you compare that with the figures, the drawings down below, you can see what we're dealing with. When it's smooth okay, or has those little knobs, as you can see, all the way on the left side, okay, you don't, that's Japanese knotweed. In the center, when you have these large hairs, that seems to be associated with the giant knotweed. And then something in between, all the way over to the right, where the arrows are pointing to, where you have just little bumps to barely hairs, that is associated with the, the hybrid or the Bohemian, Bohemian knotweed. And so as I said at the outset to this and in my conclusion here, that this may be a little too academic for your typical landowner, but it is worth noting that uh, there are three, two species and one hybrid, so three different lineages of knotweed that seem to be in play when we talk about this invasive species. And it may or may not make a difference uh, yet to be determined in terms of uh, as I mentioned, hybrid vigor and the expansion rate of particular clones in the upper Delaware. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, I'm Claire and I am coming to you from Shippensburg University. So I'm actually in South Central Pennsylvania in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, but uh, we have we have been doing a lot of work in the Delaware River Basin and in the Upper Delaware, um, mostly related to land use um, issues, but a lot of the work that we do takes place at kind of broader scales um, and uh, and we create maps and other tools um, really to help support um, landscape scale conservation planning. So, so this kind of fits into our wheelhouse. Um, and I'm going to be zooming out quite a bit from, uh, from the, the microscopic and leaf and species scale up to um, the landscape scale uh, to talk a little bit about uh, a pilot project. We're in the process of, of doing this work um, where we are attempting to map not map not weed at the uh, landscape scale and I'll be talking about some of our opportunities and challenges. Um, so next slide. So the specific objectives that we're working on um, in, in this piece of the work is to um, quantify the extent and the percentage of the 100 year floodplain um, focused on the upper Delaware that's currently colonized by knotweed. Um, as, as Steve noted and as Eric noted, this uh, kind of knotweed invasion has really um, taken over significant portions of, um, of the, the river um, and quantifying how much of that floodplain is colonized by knotweed will actually, you know, just kind of knowing that number will help us to understand kind of the ecosystem impacts of, uh, of this invasive species uh, and potentially help us to understand what some of the downstream impacts might be um, further down into, um, into the, the Delaware River. Part of that's related to something that Steve touched on earlier, um, which is another piece that we're working on is um, kind of looking at the morphology and the floodplain, uh, uh, the morphology of the floodplain and the stream bank, um, we we suspect that um, that having not weed colonize a stream bank does change how that stream bank can hang on to sediment, and so not weed invasions might actually um, help to accelerate sedimentation, and that could have again ecosystem impacts um, both here locally and, and downstream. So, so this is what we're trying to do. And from um, kind of the landscape scale of invasive species mapping um, with, with plants, 
there's not a lot of work to draw on. So, um, so, so we, we went into this as a pilot project to see if we could develop some methodology um, to, to identify knotweed from, from the air. So we're using uh, remote sensing techniques. So next slide, please. Yep. Um, and remote sensing kind of a, in a uh, broadly defined is obtaining information about objects or areas from a distance. So, you know, our eyeballs, our remote sensing instruments, our ears, our remote sensing instruments. Um, this example that I've got here of a radar detector is a remote sensing in uh, instrument. Um, in you know, kind of in the landscape field or land use field, we think about collecting information from um, from airplanes or satellites that has to do with um, the surface of the Earth in some way. So, um, the, in the next slide, um, you'll see that uh, we have been working with um, with a with a nonprofit called Lighthawk, um, and this is a a group of volunteer pilots who will fly their airplanes for um, conservation purposes. Another piece of this um, project is, uh, you know, is to also look at how we can be more cost effective in terms of gathering this type of information. And so working with Lighthawk um, and their team of volunteer uh, pilots has been, um, you know, kind of a, a, a new way to approach this. And uh, Steve, I don't know if he's going to talk more about this, but but Steve has been working directly with Lighthawk. Um, I don't you know, so essentially putting a a camera up on a plane and then flying over the river um, at different times of the year to capture images of knotweed. And so you can see in this image, um, similar to, to what you saw from Steve, although this image is importantly sort of looking straight down instead of an oblique view. But on the right hand side of the bank, you can clearly see um, that kind of lighter colored uh, green areas is uh, is our knotweed. So it's very easy to see even um, from the air. So next slide. The approach that we are um, testing right now is a mapping approach called image segmentation, which is something that um, is used in, for example, medical imaging um, and uh, in kind of graphics uh, imaging. So in this example, you can see that with, with an image segmentation algorithm, um, these algorithms kind of group up um, pixels that have the same color or value and creates kind of solid objects out of them. And in the next slide, you can see this is um, an approach that is commonly used in um, mapping land use. Um, so, so we're not going way out of our um, way out on a limb to use image segmentation, although, uh, and actually, if you look at the next slide, again, this is our image of, um, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, thanks. Um, this is our image of that knotweed, sorry, back up one. I think it's just slow on my, thank you. <laughs> can you back up one? Yes. Okay, I, yeah. So can we go back to the, can we go to the mapping knotweed with the light hawk? Yes, thank you. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, the uh, image segmentation, you know, it's really um, works on the, the same principles that our eyes and brains work. So, you know, you can kind of group pixels together that have a similar look. And so an image like this um, is really a great candidate for using image segmentation because when knotweed colonizes an area, it is a, you know, it appears the same throughout that whole area. Uh, and this is how other, um, large scale knotweed mapping projects have uh, have have taken. So let's go to the next slide and see where we are. Okay. So the challenge, uh, the challenges that we have run into um, so far um, are things re related really to 
um, shadows and sun angles. And this is a this is again an, another common problem when we're using um, uh, airplanes to collect images. You can see in this image, the image on the left is a mosaic of multiple photos that were taken on the same day. But you can also see um, that there are kind of some, uh, you know, it's not exactly a smooth transition between all of these images. And that's partly due to the fact that the images uh, in some cases were taken at different times of the day. So we have different sun angles illuminating the landscape in different ways. Um, and and if photos are captured too late in the day where you have a low sun angle, then we have a lot of shadows. And along the riverbank, shadows from adjacent forests, for example, could shade out uh, where the knotweed is. So, uh, so we're, um, <clears throat> we're, we're kind of working through some of those challenges um, as we're, we're testing out and developing our methodology. There's also um, kind of in an ideal world, we had wanted to capture images of knotweed when it is in full leaf. So kind of all leafed out, you know, peak um, leaf coverage. Um, we wanted to get another image of knotweed when it is in bloom. It blooms all at the same time. And so you can really see that kind of pop out um, at the landscape. And then we also wanted to try to get an image, um, a set of images captured when the knotweed is uh, senescing. So when it's turning red. Um, and to get that sequence of image requires a lot of things to line up with, um, with weather, with the pilot, with Steve. So kind of coordinating all of that stuff together. Um, it was a challenge for us to collect all of those um, phenology stages um, in, in sort of one season. So we're, we're a little bit limited in the data that we have. Um, and you know, along with all of the technical problems and weather, this has been a little bit slower. So um, I've, I've, Steve and I have said several times, it's kind of a, causing us to pull our hair out, but hopefully within the next couple months, we'll have at least some draft maps of where knotweed is in the floodplain for um, a few areas along the Delaware. Next slide, please. So we are also kind of in a parallel effort looking at um, using LIDAR data to um, help to map out the morphology of the floodplain. And if you're not familiar with LIDAR, this is another remote sensing technique that is usually acquired um, in airplanes and um, an uh, uh, instrument on the airplane will shoot laser pulses down to the ground and then those laser pulses will reflect back up to the aircraft and the um, sensor will record essentially the time it takes for the laser pulse to return back up to the airplane. Um, and from that, you can determine the distance. So if you know the altitude of the plane um, and you know the distance that the laser um, uh, uh, went, um, then you can use that to create you can use that to acquire three-dimensional information. So um, in the next slide, you can kind of get a sense for the type of information that we can pull from LIDAR. Um, the thing to keep in mind with LIDAR is that, that this is the, a LIDAR data set. It's actually kind of a what we call a point cloud because each place where the LIDAR strikes the surface of the Earth, and that could be, you know, bare ground, that could be water, that could be vegetation or buildings, each place where it strikes the surface is a point. Um, and so you get this cloud of points. And in this case, in this image, water is characterized as blue. So you can see the, the Delaware River. Brown is um, the, the ground, so the, the, the surface of the earth, that's the terrain. And then white is vegetation. And so the idea uh, and actually for the upper Delaware, there was LIDAR that was acquired just back in 2019. So we have a very recent um, data set and a high quality data set to work with. Um, so you can see the vegetation, the ground, the river, and um, we wanted to use, or we want to use LIDAR to characterize 
the bank morphology. So within the floodplain. So is it steep? Is it flat? Um, and we were also hoping to separate knotweed from the trees because knotweed has a very um, even canopy. Um, and we we're hoping to sort of be able to use the, those characteristics to kind of tease it out. But it has been um, a little bit of a, <laughs> again, a little bit of a struggle. So in the next slide, um, you can see an aerial view. Um, and in these, these are just three examples taken from different areas along the river. The blue dots, again, are um, points that are classified as water. Um, and then the, the kind of brownish um, areas are classified as, um, as upland and, and vegetation. Um, and what you notice in a few places along the edge of the river is that there's a lot of blue dots that overlap with uh, areas that in these photos are actually dry land. And that's because rivers are dynamic. And um, at the time when these uh, LIDAR data sets were acquired, it was a time of relatively high water. And so, um, so there was actually water covering parts of the floodplain um, at the time of, of this acquisition. And so, so that's going to limit what we can say about the riverbanks um, in, in some cases. So, so again, these are things that are uh, in development right now. Um, if we go to the next slide, you'll sort of see where we are. Um, they, that uh, it's easier said than done. That's how I'm feeling at this point in time. Um, but this is a really important um, uh, pilot project because, as I said, there aren't a lot of examples of um, of kind of landscape level mapping of knotweed. Um, and so if we're able to accomplish this in the Delaware and connect it to um, some of these ecosystem uh, impacts for things related to, to sedimentation, for example, um, that could be a really significant um, step forward. So I think the last of my slides is just my contact information um, and the contact information for the the research analyst Alfonso, uh, who's working on this, and I will um, hand the reins over, I think, maybe back to Steve. Thank you, Claire and Eric. So when Eric was floating the river, he was amazed by how much knotweed there was. And he, he made this point that there is so much biomass in knotweed that we probably are starting to forget what healthy riparian vegetation looks like. And uh, I wanted to include this picture of what it should look like, not knotweed, and uh, to remind us all that where you have healthy riparian vegetation, you have lots of things going on. There are probably hundreds of species of plants in this one view. And, uh, and uh, the Upper Delaware is very biodiverse, uh, which supports a lot of different uh, living things. But the less biodiversity we have, um, the, the, the less number of living things we're going to have. So um, one of the parts of the research that hasn't started yet, because it's going to rely on the mapping that Claire is doing, um, is to look at the impacts on stream uh, banks and to see if there are, in fact, um, de degradations that are taking place in terms of soils being washed into the river. So here is an example where you have a stand of knotweed on the left that had grown down into the river plain and then high water came through and washed the soil away. And you know knotweed doesn't like to have its feet in the water but it does like to be close to it. So here is this zone where the knotweed has for now been um, you know, set back, but there's nothing to take its place. And the knotweed will end up growing into that area again. Next slide. Here's a more graphic example where you can see uh, the only thing left here is cobble and gravel. The soils are gone because the knotweed didn't hold the soils in the last high water event. Um, we had around New Year's, we had the big runoff when we had all the snow and then it got warm and rained. Uh, 
and uh, the river rose to a level that it hasn't risen in a couple of years. And you can see knotweed has been flattened in a good part of the floodplain as the waters came up. And that's, that's a time when the soils aren't being kept in place. So by the end of this year, we, we hope to have some models um, through sampling and analysis of uh, what is happening with the soils here where there's not weed. Next slide, please. So lots of research, but we also want to take action. And, uh, and the way we want to take action is by quantifying the problem, but also giving people information that they can use to go and tackle their own knotweed on their property. And, uh, uh, you know, I live on the river. I've been tackling my knotweed for 15 years. I'd say I'm not winning, but I'm not losing either. I'm kind of holding it together. And uh, eradication is really difficult. It's uh, expensive and it requires the use of some things that some people might not want to use like herbicides. Um, it's easy to deal with if you find some isolated early plantings, but once it gets established like we're seeing on large stretches of the river, it's very difficult to deal with. So some people may want to address containing the knotweed, keeping it from further spreading, keeping it from setting seeds that are going to wash downstream um, and allowing other uh, riparian vegetation to compete with it and, uh, and try to keep it in bay. And uh, by doing that, you may allow other vegetation to establish and, uh, and foster succession um, for, for, the, for the river plain to try to come back and, uh, and give the you know, diverse vegetation that all the creatures want. Next slide, please. So what we've done is come up with a methodology where we're going to establish demonstration sites in three locations. And at each of the demonstration sites, we're going to demonstrate different knotweed management techniques. Um, so the one that I use is repeated mechanical cutting. Um, number of people attempt to cut and, uh, and do it either by mowing, which is very effective, or by using a, a sickle or a scythe or a, a weed whacker. And uh, in my case, I use the weed whacker because I, I wanna be selective. I wanna cut not weed, but not cut the things that I want to compete with it. So, uh, it, you know, I'm not gonna get rid of the not weed that way, but I am going to keep it at bay. Um, another very effective technique to uh, control not weed is by cutting it and then covering it with a geotextile membrane. You can use a tarp or some other things that we will uh, share. Um, and uh, in our case, we're working with Owens Corning to use a membrane that they use in landscape um, situations that is very thick and impermeable. And we believe that if it's kept in place for a while, meaning a few years, that it will uh, eradicate the knotweed in that area. Um, perhaps the most effective way to eradicate knotweed is through the use of herbicides. And there are two methods of herbicide um, application. One is to cut the knotweed early in the year and then the new growth that comes up probably later in the summer spray onto the leaves of the plants that have come up. Um, that's okay, but it doesn't, it, the, the herbicides can drift into other vegetation that you don't really want to um, affect. And if it's next to the river, we, we don't encourage at all the use of herbicides where the herbicides can, uh, can go into the river. Um, the most effective way to use herbicides for knotweed is to directly inject each plant with, uh, with herbicides. And there are tools for that, and there's techniques for that. Uh, but as you can imagine, that is a very, very labor-intensive um, uh, operation because in any in any like square 
yard or square meter of, of knotweed, there are probably uh, 10 to 15 different stems. So getting through a large section of knotweed would require a lot of, a lot of work and a lot of injection. Um, and then finally, what we want to demonstrate is that uh, another technique that's been used in other places to combat invasive weeds is the foraging with uh, sheep or goats. And so we've uh, contracted with a goat farmer who's going to come into these plots in the spring, bring his goats in, um, let them eat the knotweed, and probably bring them in for a day at a time every two weeks. So just keep attacking it uh, throughout the season. And, uh, you know, we're all going to learn a little bit from this. In fact, you know, uh, up until the last, uh, until our generation, where there was a lot more date, dairy farming, um, there, I've heard stories from dairy farmers where they would graze their cows in riparian areas. So, um, you know, we don't, we don't encourage that because uh, that can lead to some stream bank uh, uh, de degradation. But there used to be more foraging of, of plants in the riparian plain, and that's not happening now. So we're going to try to uh, see if introducing goats is going to have an impact. And, uh, and we're going to do that at each of the three sites. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is this is a map of uh, Skinner's Falls. Um, the area that we're going to tackle is the area between, and this is a uh, park service, uh, a river access site with parking and some uh, amenities, and but it's owned by the New York State DEC. So our partners for this project um, at this site are uh, DEC and the Park Service. And we're going to take this stretch of knotweed, which is very dense, um, between the parking lot and the river, and divide it up into uh, six plots, each about 25 feet by 125 feet. And, uh, and so each plot will have a different management technique. And there'll be some interpretation, and we'll do some events there. And at the conclusion of the project, we're going to try to assess the effectiveness of each of these uh, methods through a survey of what's left and what other vegetation has managed to compete and calculate the cost of each of these um, <coughs> excuse me, techniques and share this information with people so that they can uh, choose a method that they might want to use uh, and understand uh, what the outcomes might be and what the relative costs might be. Next slide. So this is good. Um, so thank you. The map on the right is the uh, are the sites that we're going to have demonstration projects in. We actually looked at four sites, uh, but we've ended up selecting two for full year in place demonstration projects. So Skinner's Falls that we just saw, and then Deposit Village Park, which is a new park up on the West Branch in Deposit owned by the village. Um, the village is um, in the process of turning that into an amenity for uh, village residents and others with picnicking and, uh, and uh, boat access and a bird blind. And the site is full of knotweed. So we've we're working with them to establish one of these demonstration projects there. And then at Hancock Fireman's Field, we plan to do a couple of like one day demonstrations where we'll bring in the goats, we'll bring in the uh, licensed herbicide applicator, we'll show the, the geotextile membrane, we'll show cutting and, uh, and try to share the information um, with people uh, directly. So. Thank you. Um, let's try to open this up for questions now. I'm going to take a look at the questions um, that have been uh, submitted and um, I will read them off. So 
Kevin Millar. Um, so his question is a good one. It's will the mode pieces readily regrow? So the literature is, um, is a little mixed on that. There is literature that says that uh, knotweed will regrow from a very small, like one millimeter segment of the rhizome, perhaps from nodes on the stalk. But uh, my, my, my question is, what is the level of effort to, um, um, you know, not only cut it, but also gather it, dispose of it. And in my experience, I haven't seen much in the way of regrowth from the mode pieces, which I leave in place. Um, so it readily composts and it, and it readily mulches down. Um, others might have different perspective on that. I think that um, the, the literature that talks about how it can regrow from cuttings is thinking about cutting using a flail cutting method where you're, um, where you're flailing um, the, you know, uh, like an old rotary mower where you're flailing up the plant and cutting it that way, which pulls up the rhizome, which definitely you don't want to do. But if you just cut it horizontally and just have the stem, it seems to um, really degrade and mulch. Um, so uh, next question, Tom Shravinsky has asked, what type of control, natural or otherwise, is used in the native range of this plant? That's also a very good question. Um, the, uh, so there is research going on that has taken a look at a knotweed psyllid, which is a bug that, that lives in the ranges of Japan where knotweed is present and seems to control it. And uh, we've been tracking that research. I know Eric has as well. And, uh, and the researcher from Cornell did a presentation this year uh, where he had, he had uh, gotten permission to release some of these psyllids in, in the wild in controlled plots and then look at the outcome. And the title of his talk was the psyllid sucks. So the psyllid is supposed to control knotweed by uh, sucking on the stems of the plants, stems and leaves of the plants and sapping its energy. But what he was finding was that there wasn't a whole lot of reproduction going on by the psyllid. And he doesn't think that this method will necessarily be effective. The, the research was on the psyllid was um, first conducted out west where um, the predominant plant is the giant knotweed and uh, the psyllid that they selected was from the region where of Japan where the giant knotweed is predominant. So uh, when, when he tested it on Japanese knotweed in uh, Broome County and, and one other place in our region, he didn't find that they were terribly happy. Uh, but uh, you know, there are a lot of people looking at biocontrols for knotweed. And uh, we, we really want to make sure that any biocontrols that, that people uh, decide are effective are also not going to create other problems. As Eric said in his, um, in his part, knotweed is in the buckwheat family. And uh, we wouldn't want a bug to be released that would affect people growing buckwheat. And that was trialed in, uh, in, the, in this particular insect, but um, uh, they didn't find that it liked the buckwheat as much as the knotweed, but in the end, it didn't like the knotweed too much either. Um, next question, um, Kevin Millar again, do 100% of the stems need to be injected to achieve the desired results? Uh, pretty much yes. Um, the, uh, the way that our uh, herbicide applicator intends to address this is to um, uh, go through the patch, inject the knotweed, and then revisit it a month or two later to see if there are any plants that either didn't take or uh, they missed. Uh, 
and go through it again. I imagine that uh, it could be a, you know, it could be something that would have to be done over the course of a couple of years just to get through um, all of the plants. Uh, I have a, uh, a uh, show and tell. This is the knotweed rhizome. And uh, it's this thick, hairy clunk of root. But the knotweed rhizome is connected to the other plants through what are runner roots. And so when you look at when you look at the uh, at a stand of knotweed, that could all be one large clone of rhizome nodes with runner roots going to out and then setting up new plants and new rhizomes. So um, we it'd be great if you inject one plant and then it kills the rhizome and uh, and doesn't allow any other plants to grow. But because this is all a big interconnected mass, I don't think it's going to work that way. Next question. Michael Zuck asks, how can I get goats to eat my knotweed? Um, it, it wasn't very easy to find a goat farmer that had goats and he was willing to work on this project. A lot of people have goats. Um, they're very protective. The goats um, are, uh, are used to what they're used to. But, but our goat farmer says that they also like novelty. And that's one of the reasons we're doing this project um, with uh, them visiting the site repeatedly for short periods of time so they don't get bored. So um, I'm hoping that that will draw enough attention, the method that other goat farmers will step forward and be willing to um, bring their goats to other people that are looking to try to manage knotweed that way. And uh, um, we'll, we'll just have to see. Um, I've got time for one or two more questions. Steve, it's, it's Eric here. I'd like to just jump in really quick with uh, an important one. Uh, a little bit further down, there's a couple of questions around use of herbicides as well as um, good mechanical uh, cutting practices. And so I think this is an important point. Uh, mechanical cutting, as Steve just mentioned, uh, does work, but the rhizome needs to be exhausted. The underground horizontal stem needs to be exhausted. So you have to do it repetitively uh, for a while. Uh, and what that means is that you could potentially expose that soil to erosion, as Steve was talking about, as the plants are being kind of denuded, if you will, as you're beating them back, that sort of thing. So nothing is perfect. You're going to have to spend a lot more time if you go about mechanical cutting um, and you may end up uh, with a big area of erosion before anything gets any better. Um, one of the things, though, with regard to mechanical cutting that is often prescribed, a lot of the folks who do work in state parks, for example, in the state of Pennsylvania and the region, will often use mechanical cutting for the first couple of preparatory treatments before treating the actual knotweed. And what that does is it causes the stems to become weakened and you get a smaller plant instead of trying to look at something that's 10 feet tall, um, you actually get re-sprouts, which are a lot easier to, to treat. And so that leads to the final point, which is about herbicides. Obviously, one of the major issues with herbicides here, even if we set aside people's philosophies uh, around herbicides and whether they should be used in natural areas and so on, is the fact that we are near an aquatic uh, ecosystem. And so typically when we talk about using herbicides within uh, riparian zones, uh, herbicide applicator training is necessary and the right types of herbicides are necessary. And so even if you poo poo, I don't need any kind of permit, uh, you should keep in mind that one of the issues with herbicides is not necessarily the herbicide compound itself because they are designed to affect processes in plants. But the issue is, is that they're mixed with other what we call adjuvants things that are sticking agents or that help for the herbicide to penetrate the foliage. And those types of sticking agents or adjuvants are often implicated in toxicity in aquatic ecosystems. That is, if 
you spray the herbicide on the foliage and a rainstorm comes and washes it off into the waterway. It's not necessarily the herbicide that's gonna be a bad thing for the fish. It may be the other things that were the sticking agents that caused the herbicide to stick to the leaf in theory. But again, timing of application is really important in terms of uh, you know, the, the dryness of the leaf and any kind of rain events and so on. And so um, I realize we're out of time and I'll have to leave it there, but that is to say, uh, those of you who are on this that are really looking for actionable kind of information, I hope you stick with it um, and stick with this, this uh, educational effort here because we'll be rolling out a lot more detailed information um, as uh, 2021 gets underway. Thanks, Eric. So there are 25 more questions. We will address all of the questions in writing um, and follow up at a later date. And uh, we will be looking for people that want to be involved in this project as volunteers or as, um, you know, people that want to share the information with your neighbors um, for the, to work on the sites or to get the word out. And uh, thank you all for joining.